So let's get started here. Um, to those of us joining us tonight, welcome to the meetup. This is Streamline Athletes live event series where we're speaking with some former collegiate athletes uh, who've had a lot of success at the collegiate level and have moved on to the professional ranks. Uh, this is episode three, starting blocks. And I'm sure you can guess that starting blocks, we're going to be talking to some sprinters today. Uh, today, we'll be chatting with two Canadian Olympic sprinters who are still very much at the top of their game and I think probably have some big plans here for 2021 and beyond. Um, my name is Brett Montrose. I am one of our founders and co-CEOs at Streamline Athletes. Streamline Athletes is the place to be if you're a high school track and field athlete looking for collegiate opportunities. Streamlineathletes.com, pop on over, create your profile, and you can get in touch with coaches in just a single click. And with that, I'd love to just get some audience engagement going on here early. So please pop on in the chat. Let us know what grade you're in, what events you compete in. And uh, you can use the chat throughout the session if any questions come up. And if we have questions, I'll make sure that we save some time before the end to get to some audience questions. Now, I am stoked to be introducing our guests today. Firstly, I'm going to jump to Mr. Aaron Brown. Aaron is a former University of Southern California Trojan. He's a Canadian sprinter who specializes in both the 100 and 200 meters events. Aaron has an Olympic bronze medal as part of Canada's four by 100 meter relay team, which he earned at the 2016 Summer Games in Rio. He's also a 2012 Olympian. Aaron has medals as part of Canada's relay teams in the four by 100 meter event at the 2013 and 2015 World Champs. And during his time at USC, Aaron earned All-American status in both the 100 and 200 meter events. Aaron, thanks for joining us and congrats on the, on the fast season opener. How's training going and, and where are you joining us from today? I appreciate it. Training's going really well. Uh, feeling healthy, ready to compete and hopefully travel. Um, you know, with COVID and everything, it's kind of difficult this year, but you know, it seems to be working and looks like we're gonna have a season. Um, I'm reporting now from Louisiana because we have a training camp in LSU before we head over to Poland for the World Relays. Um, so just training for that and then got the rest of the season before. Too. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome today and thanks for making some time to chat with us. No doubt. Our second guest today joining us on the panel is Andre DeGrasse. Yeah. Also a USC uh, alumnus who transferred after his sophomore year from Coffeyville Community College, which we'll probably speak a little bit about today. Um, Andre is a Canadian sprinter, also specializing in both the 100 and 200 meters events. He's got a silver medal in the 200 and bronze medals in both the one and four by one from the same Olympics in 2016 in Rio. Canadian record holder in the 200 meter, bronze medal in the 100 and a silver in the 200 at the 2019 World Championships and the NCAA champion in both the 100 and 200 meters events. Andre, welcome to the meetup, starting blocks episode. It's great to have you as well as Aaron chatting with us today. Um, and also congratulations on a, on a pretty wicked season opener. How are you feeling coming off of a 999 this last weekend? Yeah, thanks Brett for having me. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm training is going good. Uh, I'm pretty happy with my uh, season opener. Uh, it's the fastest I've ever opened up uh ever <laughs> so um this early in the season so it feels pretty good and i'm pretty uh, excited for the rest of the season awesome well great to have you and it's probably good season for for both of you guys to have fast season openers especially considering the lack of competition indoor and last year so you know it's it's an olympic year and i'm sure it's harder to start fast than than ever before so congratulations on uh, the oh, yeah. early success and uh and welcome um, so as you guys know, we, we specialize in, in helping the high schoolers get to the collegiate level, um, which is something that I know, um, was a different and, and unique journey for, for both of you guys. Um, maybe for Aaron, it was a little more planned and for Andre, it came about a little bit more as a, as a surprise later on coming from other sports. Um, but I would love to just hear about uh, how you got into the sport early on because we're going to have some high schoolers on the call today and I'm sure they're curious about um, how they line up with uh, Canada's top sprinters um, compared to 
where they are as, as, as young guns or, or new people to the sport. So Aaron, why don't we, we start with you? Um, I have in my, my notes here and I learned that you played some basketball growing up. Um, sorry, <laughs> you, you played, uh, you played, um, um, uh, oh, yeah, this is a good one. We still sorry, play one on one. See if you're nice. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a curveball in there. Um, I jumped to to the wrong part of my my notes, but I wanted to start with this quote. Um, to be number one, you must train like you're number two. Does that still ring true for you, Aaron? And can you tell us kind of where that quote comes from and uh, how that has carried you through your career, if it has at all? Yeah. Um... I can't remember who said it, but it was, a, it was an athlete. Um, might've been Maurice Green or something like that, that I saw it from. But basically it's just a mentality uh, quote, basically setting your mindset saying like, even if you win or you're on top, you have to have the mentality of someone who's second, because that's basically the hungriest position you can be in. You know, you're one spot away from the top. So um, you got to keep that same hunger and mentality to go hard and try to keep climbing and never be complacent with where you're at. Um, it's definitely a quote that I try to live by. Um, I got my man in the in the chat right here that I'm always competing with, trying to be number one, going back and forth with him. So, you know, you just got to be hungry and got to keep competing and going after your dreams. You know, it's it's just it's just the mentality you have to have to in order to, to keep climbing. And speaking on that mentality, um, can you tell us about how you started running track? I, I understand that. Uh, you're probably around the age of 16 and maybe watching the 2008 Beijing Olympics was some inspiration for you. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I actually started by accident. You know, I, I did track just as a thing to do in sports. You know, I was always active and fast. I just like to do every sport. So I'd go from basketball to football, you know, I did soccer and then track season came around. So I'm like, I, I guess I'll, you know, mess around with that. And um, I got noticed by my club coach who told me to come out and run. So um, from there, I just kind of got deeper and deeper into the sport, learning different things that I could join. And then that opened the door to getting a scholarship to USC. Um, but it just started with me just having fun and just playing sports just to stay active. Um, and yeah, just kind of ended up where I am today. Yeah, so pretty natural athlete all around and then and found track at, at 16 was that when you first competed was was around 2008 2009 is that right that was the first time I won off so, um in grade 10 but I did run in grade nine um but you know I was running in like basketball shoes and basketball shorts so I didn't use blocks like I just did a three-point stance um so it wasn't really official I didn't actually like train for it or practice until grade 10 so that's about the time like 15 16 around there all right. And this seems like a pretty good segue because I could see Andre smirking there, the, the basketball <laughs> shoes and the, ba <laughs> Does the like do the, the basketball shoes and the basketball shorts for some reason seem uh, familiar to you. I heard maybe that's how, how you got started as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was what? Uh, I was 17. Um, I remember I was this is how it all really started. I was on I was on the bus, on the Toronto Transit bus. Um, I think I was leaving school to go do a co-op placement. Um, I think I was either going, I think it was, yeah, car car mechanics. I was trying to go like to a car mechanic shop, painting my resume, just going to different spots, do a co-op position for school. And I literally just saw my friend on the school bus um, and he was he was in like track attire. And I was like, oh, what's up? And like, I never seen you in like forever. Like, where you been? And he was like, yeah, I've been training training for track. I'm going out to York University. Um, they have a track meet this this weekend, so I'm just going to practice. Um, and I was like laughing and joking with him. And I was telling him like, I was like, bro, you're probably not even that fast. Like I'd probably beat you like down down the field. Like, and we started joking around and talking, but he's like, no, really, like you should come out, come out and play, come out and uh, come out and run. And uh, to be honest, I was like, all right, fine, I'll do it. I'm not doing anything that weekend. So I'll, I'll come out and, and, and uh, yeah, I guess race to you, see, see who's, you know, made, made a little small, little wager, small little bet, <laughs> 50 bucks <laughs> at the time. And um, so I went out there, uh, I asked, first of all, first I had to ask my school teacher. I was like, uh, can I even get on the track team right now? Because like, I know like you have to try out and 
and things like that. And she was like, no, 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 you can come on in. Like, we know you from basketball because I was on the basketball team at the time. She's like, yeah, we need some extra, extra people for the relay and all that. So yeah, come on in. And so I got there. Um, she let me on the team. I got a singlet. Uh, <laughs> it was so different because I'm used to wearing my basketball jersey. And I'm like, oh, this is a singlet. OK, OK, cool, cool. Um, but then I went out there and I'm like, I didn't realize that you actually need like like compression shorts and spikes and no idea. I just put on the singlet and I had like a, a T-shirt just underneath, like a basketball T-shirt underneath. Um, <laughs> and some some shoes and I got out there and I was just like whoa wait hold up what did I get myself into uh I see blocks everywhere I see people just going cha 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 and like making all this like I'm like oh this is crazy this is serious um so I was, actually was pretty pretty nervous but I was like hey I got nothing to lose like I'm just racing my friend um I, I got really nothing to prove and I just went out there and I ran and um I ended up running fast <laughs> running 10-9 that day, and um, that's kind of really like how I really, that's how it all kind of really started, how I got into it. I ended up, I came, I came second that day. I actually, you know, lost actually one of our relay teammates. Um, his name is Baladi, so he's on our relay relay team as well, our Olympic bronze medal team. But yep. but uh, it was uh, it was pretty cool experience just, uh, just going out there and racing for the first time. That's an incredible story, and it's, it's uh, funny how similar that is for for both of you guys. Um, also similar is the fact that you both went to USC. So obviously USC, a fairly well-known sprinting school, you get a little sunshine down in California too, which I don't think uh, anybody's, <laughs> anybody's complaining about. Um, but you guys weren't at school at the same time, right? No. No. I, I um, graduated right as he came in. So when I was a senior, I was actually his host on his visit when he came to USC. And, yeah, uh, good times, good times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, went down to Lorenzo Apartments and played some hoops, and then went got some crab legs and uh, boiling crab. Um, so it was, it was a pretty cool visit, you know, real chill and stuff. And then, you know, as soon as I left, um, I had to go train with Nike Group, so I moved down to Florida, and that's when he went to USC. So kind of exchanged places. He was the new Canadian on the on the scene. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So sure. Aaron, you, Aaron's the one who paved the way. So I would. I would love to go there first. You were there first. So let's hear um, what was that experience like coming from OFSA? If there's any Canadians who are on the call today, they're probably familiar with what OFSA is out of all the Canadian provinces. This is probably the biggest high school meet that there is. We, we joke about it because it's kind of like the mini Canadian Olympics. It's, it's OFSA and it happens in Ontario. It's a big deal. So you get recruited after being successful at OFSA initially in, in grade 10. And then you had some great success through uh, grade 11 and 12. Um, but how did you get in touch with USC um, and and how did you make this decision when you were looking at all these programs that were out there? Um, I mean, there's there's 1,700 different schools with track and field teams when we're looking at uh, the small community colleges and the Canadian systems and all the way up to D1, right? So I'd love to just hear about that and how you got in touch with USC and um, hear your story. And then Andre, will will uh, we'll see how you got there afterwards. Yeah, so um, basically my story um started in grade 10 right so that's when I won OFSA and I got my first letter from a college and that was Cornell and I didn't know anything about the NCAA at that point um so I didn't even know if Cornell's track team was good or not they're more, they're an Ivy League school so they're more known for their academics and stuff so um you know my friends kind of made fun of me thinking I was doing something getting a scholarship offer from them but um I went to World Youth the next year you know after I got that first letter I was motivated to kind kind of um, show what I could do if I actually trained for the sport. And so grade 11 was the first year I actually trained for it, like um, coming to practice and working hard. Um, and then I ran with the club team and I ran 10-5 at OFSA in my grade 11 season. And that was the number one time in Canada for under 17, which qualified me for um, World Youth Competition, which was in Italy. And so I went over there and I ended up getting silver and broke the Canadian record running 10:46. And after I ran that, um, there was college coaches there recruiting. And my first um, college coach that recruited me was actually from Florida State. It was uh, Coach Ken, who's, you know, a big, tall guy. And I was like, who's this guy? And he, you know, had the Florida State logo on his jacket. And I got all crazy and hyped. But um, after that, you know, um, all these colleges started hitting me up and sending me 
letters and telling me I could come out on a visit and all this stuff. So um, I had to submit my SAT scores. Well, first I had to write them and then I had to submit the scores to make sure that was good enough for me to you know, get accepted into the school and their programs. Um, once they did that, I took some visits to some schools. You know, I went to USC, I went to Florida State, and I went to Texas A&M. Um, and then there was other schools that were recruiting like Florida, uh, Florida uh, LSU, Tennessee, Arizona State, and other schools like that. Um, and then I basically decided uh, my pick of where I wanted to go. Um, so I ended up deciding to go to USC just because I liked, you know, Southern California. It was a big city like Toronto. Um, the weather obviously is amazing. Um, the football team, I remember seeing a game where they were playing Ohio State in 2008, and um, their USC is ranked number one. And, you know, when uh, the football game is going on and they show, like, the city, like, the backdrop and all that stuff and in between, like, plays and all that. So I'm like, yo, L.A. looks crazy. And I always wanted to go um, to the West Coast, and I looked on the map, and I saw, like, Toronto was way up here and L.A. was down here. So I'm like, yeah, I want to go as far away from my parents as possible just because I, I wanted to be on my own and be a big man, you know, I was, I was young, 18 and stupid, but um, yeah. So I, I did four years there and, you know, had some of the best years of my life, just uh, being on campus and stuff, you know, the academics were great, the coaches were great, and I made a lot of friends that I have for life. So it's a great experience overall. Yeah, USC campus, the city, everything looks pretty, pretty <laughs> incredible down there. Um, did you get to see a football game on your visit? Yeah, I did. Um, yeah, that's yeah, it was, it was crazy. I actually got to go on the field um, before the game. You know, they gave us a pass, brought us on the field. They got to talk to a couple of the players. So, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. And did you know once you started talking to all these coaches that, um, you know, kind of as a top elite athlete, it was always you were always looking at NCAA Division One. And since you wanted to be far away from home, the states just made sense to you. Did you take a look at, at the Canadian landscape at all or was were you just focused on being down as far south as you could get? Yeah, I, I didn't really look at Canada because um, my teammates all were like bigging up the NCAA system, saying like that's where all the best athletes go and they get full ride scholarships and stuff. So naturally, I just wanted to go for the best uh, opportunity I had. And they they basically told me not to even bother looking at Canadian schools. So, um, yeah, it was always just the NCAA once I learned about that. Awesome. Um, Andre, your story was uh, a little bit different and, and how you got to USC. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? And the, uh, I think it was a two-year pit stop that you made on route in your first couple of years of, of collegiate sprinting, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it took me a minute. It took me a minute to get to USC. Uh, but, I, <laughs> but I made my way. I made my way. Um, so, yeah, I started at, um, at uh, Coffeyville Community College. It's a small town in Kansas. Um, I can't, I can't believe I went there, but, <laughs> but it still was a great experience, um, to be honest. Um, so yeah, I, I literally started cause I started track so late. Um, I remember, um, uh, my coach, uh, Tony Sharp, um, he was like telling me about how like, yeah, the NCAA, just like Aaron, the NCAA is the way to go. Um, you know, that's where all the best athletes go. If you really want to take track seriously. And so at the time I was like, okay, cool. Great. Um, but then when, uh, Tony looked at my transcript, he was like, oh, buddy, uh, we're going to have to, we're going to have to go to junior college. We're going to have to, we're going to have to uh, make our way up because literally I did not take the SATs. And even if I did take that, I would have to score really, really high, um, in order to, um, to go to NCAA school. So he was like, well, we could just take a JUCO route. Uh, you do two years there, you get your grades up and then you can make your way to the NCAA. So I said, okay. Uh, let's do that. Um, so it was pretty simple. Um, yeah, I stayed there for two years. I competed. Um, great time, actually. Um, it wasn't, uh, I made a lot of friends there. Um, even though it was a really, really small town, especially coming from Toronto, the big city, um, it was, it was a big adjustment for me, uh, just being there, but literally like all we did was go to the track. Um, we, you know, we go to, uh, dinner and, and, you know, play, play PlayStation, play Xbox, and, uh, and do it all over again. Uh, there was nothing really else to do because of such a really small town. The, the biggest town was like in Oklahoma. If we, really, if we really wanted to go to the movie theater, I think we did that like once or twice, but it was really just like, yeah, go from, you know, go from practice uh, to class to eat and uh, do it all over again. So it wasn't really much to do. 
for those two years. Um, but after I was done, yeah, this is like now where I'm like, okay, I'm uh, NJ, I'm NJCAA champion, and now I have to figure out uh, what big school I want to go to. Um, so I had offers from uh, USC, UCLA, um, Florida State, um, Alabama, um, and um, I think an Oklahoma. So I took those. Those were the five visits that I took. I took all my five visits because you're only allowed to take five five visits. Um, so I visited all all of the school. All the schools were, were really great. Um, I remember I thought about going to Oklahoma because it was a Canadian coach at the time, and I thought we'd have a great connection. And then I remember taking a visit to Alabama because two other Canadians at the time, um, uh, who was I actually, I actually at the Olympics as well on our Olympic relay team, they were at Alabama. Um, and then I took a visit to Florida State, great program as well. Um, but it was just something about, it was something about USC and UCLA that I was like, man, this is it, LA. Like, I got, I got to go here. Like, this is the spot. So, I mean, I kind of, Aaron kind of led the foundation for me because I remember talking to him um, back in um, 20, I think it was 2013 or 20, 2013 at, at, in Moncton at, uh, at Canadian, Canadian Trials. He had just won the, uh, the 100 meters that year. And I remember he was asking him about USC and like what he thought about it. I was going to come out there and take a visit um, after after uh, completing my uh, my uh, studies at uh, Coffeeville. And he just told me a lot. He was like it's similar to Toronto, big city, except for obviously it is, it's nice weather. That's the only difference. Um, so I just remember like that was a tough decision because it was either going to be um, UCLA or USC. Um, but I mean, Aaron was part of Aaron sold it. Aaron so he said how great USC is just from the academic side and you know how much help they give you um, in 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 the center and then also um, on the track like uh, Carol Smith Gilbert and Quincy Watts were, were great coaches for him. So I just remember I'm like okay I think I think this is the spot for me. So I had to think about it you know for a good two to three weeks uh, because I had to make that decision soon because you know I was finishing my classes and I had to you know, go on to the next level. So, um, but then I remember his old coach, uh, Aaron's old coach that he ran with uh, was also, he transferred to UCLA as well. So I was like, man, like Aaron was telling me all this great stuff and it's because old coaches at UCLA and now it's a new coach at USC, but I also like USC campus. So that was a pretty tough decision to make, but I ended up choosing USC um, at the time. And it was, it was just, it was the best decision I ever made. So obviously the coaching worked out after all, despite the uh, <laughs> the old the old coach moving on. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so something I'd love to touch on a little bit more is the the academic piece, Andre. I know um, you went the, the JUCO route, and you probably didn't have much to do because um, you said you were playing PlayStation and Xbox. But it sounds like it kind of kept you focused enough to get your grades up and serve the purpose that that you were there for, which was to make sure that you could get to uh, the NCAA level. Um, so I just wanted to touch on uh, the junior college option because it is out there. There's a lot of programs that are smaller and don't get the same um, attention as the big NCAA schools. So um, I think the takeaway there that, that I'd like to just mention to the athletes is, is if your grades aren't quite there, then there is still another way that you can carve your own pathway. You just might have to make a, a bit of a pit stop along the way. And yeah, then for sure, definitely. Yeah. And then, Aaron, um, it, it sounds like you probably recognize that um, track could be an option for you a little bit earlier than Andre did in, in his career because he was slightly later to the game. So um, what would your advice be to someone in terms of uh, academics when they're getting ready to leave high school and, and move to uh, the collegiate ranks? Um, well, if you're early on in high school, I would say – to pay a little more attention to them. And when you're thinking about your sport career and where you wanna go, um, don't forget the academic part because that's a huge factor in where you're able to go. Um, Cause I know for me, when I was in grade nine and grade 10, before I actually started taking school seriously, um, and, or before I knew my options in track, I didn't really take school serious. Um, you know, I, I was just going through the motions and kind of worried about my social circle and being cool and hanging out and you know, just kind of just playing around, you know, the, I, I, looked in, I didn't look at school as like an avenue for 
something bigger and, and uh, an opportunity to open doors for me to, you know, go places that I never even thought of, right? So once you learn about the NCAA or this uh, CIS or wherever it is that you're trying to go, like what type of school that you're trying to um, aim for, um, make sure that you bring your academic, you know, success along with it and plan that into your, your journey um, because that can open up so many doors for you and where you're able to go. And the only reason I was able to go to the NCAA straight out of high school is because I started to shift my mindset and how, um, how much focus I put into the classroom and got my grades up, right? Um, so I, I had a huge shift from after grade 10, once I figured, figured out about the um, NCAA, um, teachers were telling me I had to get my grades up in order to do that. And you know, I had to take the SATs and all that stuff. And I was on the Dean's list every semester um, from grade 11 to 12. So all four semesters, I got on the Dean's list because I started to put in more work in the classroom to make sure that I was able to be eligible and you know, had enough, the good enough grades in order to get there. I see someone asking what my high school GPA was. Honestly, I don't even remember, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I know to get on the Dean's list, you have to get at least like an 85 or something like that, I don't know. Um, but I, I remember getting like 87 for most of my stuff, like 87, 88 you know, some 90s in there. Um, so I, I, I want to say my GPA was like 88 or 87 or, I don't know, it was a long time ago. I mean, it was like over 10 years ago. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that, that'd be my advice. And for people who are like already um, at the senior level and maybe slacked off earlier and, and you know, they'll have enough time to get their academics turned around, the, the route that Dre went going to JUCO first is there's no shame in that. Right? Sometimes people need that extra time to focus and you know, have that shift in your academic career. And you, as you see, you can end up having high success just like he did, even going the longer way. So don't even feel like the door is closed. You have to give up now. If you're a senior who listened to this, um, there's still time for you. You just might have to, you know, take a pit stop on your way to climbing to, you know, getting to a, a bigger school. Yeah, so it sounds like you, you both looked at the opportunity to live somewhere that you wanted to in terms of geography. Um, you looked at the coaching staff there and that was part of your decision. Um, I'm sure you both considered the, the academics and the facilities and the training environment, but is there anything that, um, you know, maybe a high schooler wouldn't typically think about that factored into your decision to choose USC or what was, uh, you know, maybe the little, the little piece that made that school stand out the most versus everything else? other than what you've mentioned already. And, and Andre, maybe if uh, we start with you on this one and then we'll go, we'll bounce down there. And... Yeah, um, I mean, I'm trying to think, yeah, what else, um, what else that, what else, um, other than that, I feel like for, I, I think it varies per sport, um, but I know that you, the, the main, the main thing, yeah, is like you wanna make sure that you get a good education from the school. You wanna make sure you have good coaching, um, maybe from a aspect of like living and like your social environment, like with your friends, like you feel like you can, you know, get along with these people on your, on your team, or you don't feel like that, te that, that com camaraderie, I guess, like you feel like, oh, maybe like I won't fit in with this type of group. Um, maybe that's something that you can also think of as well. Um, when you're making your decision, um, you can look at like, okay, um, I know, yeah, maybe like one of the things that I looked at as well is like, okay, am I going to get enough attention um, when I come into the school? Like, um, are, is there like so many sprinters where like, hey, I'm just going to get shoved into the group, like shoved into the pack? Or like, am I going to stand out and say, okay, well, I'm going to be, you know, get attention as well as the other guy, or if you know what I mean. Like if another, like, so for example, if a guy is running like 10-1, um, and another guy is running 10-5, the 10-5 guy might not get as much attention as the 10-1 guy. Um, so you kind of want to make sure that you're in that element to say, hey, like, I'm going to get enough attention from this coach. They're going to pay, they're going to pay me mine and they're going to help me get better. Um, so I would say that's probably one of the things also to, yeah, to look out, to look out for. Um, and then I also used to look out for, um, from an academic standpoint, is there going to be resources for you to help? Because, when you get to that level, um, it's it's really tough. It's really, um, you know, you have to go from from class to practice, um, and then you have all these assignments, 
Um, so it's a lot, it's a lot of work, you know, it, it's really a lot of time management. So you got to make sure I feel like that you have the resources um, from the school to say, hey, okay, if I need a tutor for math or a tutor for science, like, you know, make sure that the school has those type of resources so you don't fall behind um, in class because uh, I, I know from experience that a lot of people, um, you know, where, where, you know, one little slip with the time management where you go from practice, you fall asleep, you miss, you miss a test, you miss an exam. I, I've seen it happen to a lot of people. So you have to make sure that you're on top of things and that, that can really get overwhelming. So I feel like, yeah, you have to make sure that the school that you chose, that you choose um, has those resources to help you so that you don't fall behind. Yeah, Aaron, anything, anything Andre missed that you think a high schooler should really be looking out for when they're, when they're looking at universities? Yeah, that was, that was a good list and summed up a lot of what I went through when I was trying to figure out where I wanted to go. Um, I'd say another one that I thought about when I was in high school um, was just basically where I could see myself after college, right? So in the event that I wanted to stay in the same city where I went to school, I, I kind of projected and said, could I see myself living here? Because if you graduate with that degree, the place where it's most effective is that local area, right? So my college decision was narrowed down to Florida State and USC. And I needed to nitpick because I couldn't decide between the two. Like they both had great academics. They both had great uh, sports teams. They were both really great colleges, but um, ultimately it came down to me saying, okay, if I were to stay in the city that I went to school, where could I see myself living? And that's when I was saying, okay, LA is a lot like Toronto. Um, that getting a job in LA probably would be more advantageous than getting a job in Tallahassee. Um, you know, I, I just kind of narrowed it down to where I thought I would fit in best. And coming from a big city like Toronto, uh, LA felt like it would be more comfortable if I was to stay in that same city. Obviously now I'm living in Florida, but um, back then I had to project and see like if I wanted to use my degree to the fullest potential it probably would be best used in LA in that, in that market. So that was another factor to kind of think down the road. Um, if you're focusing on your academics and may not even go pro in, in your sport and track, um, think about where your degree would be best utilized. Yeah, that yeah. Makes, a ton of, makes a ton of sense. I'm happy um, also that Andre, you touched on the, the academic resources because I think that's, that's huge just to make sure that you have the support that you need to help you continue to stay eligible to even compete, even if athletics is the most important thing for you while you're at school. And it becomes apparent that you might be able to move to pursuing the sport professionally afterwards. You still need to make sure that your grades are good enough to stay eligible and win NCAA titles. So when we talk about actually performing on the track, this is, uh, this is the fun stuff. Um, Aaron, we'll, we'll start with you. What was the kind of highlight of your collegiate career when you were at USC what's the kind of the one moment that stands out in your mind as oh uh, yeah that was that was the best time I had competing uh, as a Trojan uh yeah I don't get to pick one you can, <laughs> yeah, take take whatever uh know, whatever there, whatever you're, sailing you're, you're you want. Longer than me, I know was four years since she's from <laughs> um man I'd probably say Pac-12's my senior year um you know just because I got you know Pac-12 athlete of the meet and you know I was just flying high at that point I won the one two and we won the four by one um so it was just a good overall meet to score you know a lot of points for my school because I remember as a freshman um at Pac-10s back then it was still the Pac-10 um I ended up getting hurt in the prelims of the hundred and I couldn't run the final so even though I made it you know I couldn't run and I had a lot of seniors on the team coming to me and be like, man, they're like pretty much begging me to run. I'm like, man, I, I hurt my hamstring, I can't go. And they're saying like, you know, it's my last opportunity. You know, we're trying to win a ring and win pack 10s And, um, you know, it's always been my dream. And this is my last opportunity and like trying to get me to go. And I felt bad, like I let down the team. So I said from that point on that I wanted to commit to um, committing, sorry, contributing as much points to the team as I could. And so for me, my senior year to win you know, three events um, and get Pac-12 outstanding athlete to meet. Um, it just made me feel like I actually did my my part and contributed to the team aspect as much as I could. Um, so that was, if I had to point to one time, that, I guess that's just one of the times that stands out to me. Sounds like you probably have a few more. Do you have a second one you want to share? <laughs> um, 
Man, okay. Let's see. I would say indoors my senior year as well um, at the meet in New Mexico where I ran 655 and 2053 indoors. And at the time, that was the school record and Canadian record indoors uh, before my man Dre came and broke it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I had, I was number one in the NCAA at that point um, in the 60 and the um, 200. So I, I broke the Canadian record in the 200 and the school record in both events actually. And I think I still have the 60 record. That's the only record I still have that Dre didn't come and smash. So I'm thankful for that. But um, yeah, that was that was a good meet for me because um, that was right before NCs and I was I was on good pace. And, and Andre, how about you? You had a obviously a good <laughs> career at, at USC as well. But if there was a couple shining moments that really stand out to you, where does your brain go? Uh, yeah, it was short. Uh, <laughs> I was only there for one year, so um, it definitely was short. A lot uh, happened I, in I that wish, year, though. A hey? lot. Yeah, I wish I had more. <laughs> I wish I had more memories, um, but. I mean, yeah, for sure, like, um, the NCAA championship is number one. Um, didn't expect to really run that fast. Um, that was just a crazy experience to, to win the 100 and 200 um, double. Um, so, I mean, for me, that was uh, the highlight of my uh, collegiate career at USC, for sure. Um, and then I think for the second one, um, uh, I think it's like the, the the dual meet. We have a dual meet usually to see like who's the who's the best in LA between USC and versus UCLA. And uh, I just remember like how crazy it was. Like like everyone was like, you know, UCLA is the best. No, USC is the best. And I I felt like I felt like that was like the most pressure effort because I never like experienced something like that before. So I was like, you know, my coach was like, you have to run everything. We need you to run the the, uh, the four by four as well <laughs> and I was like what is going on like <laughs> she's like we need the points we have to show that we're the best team in LA um so that was a pretty cool experience I remember uh so I ran the one the two the four by one almost ran the 400 as well but luckily we had enough people for that um so I ran the four by four and I remember it, it came down to that last event um and who's whoever won the four by four was going to win was gonna win the, uh, the the title for um for the best in LA, uh, so I and I remember I was just so tired. I was like, oh, I don't want to let the team down. I didn't, I really didn't want to run because I was like so tired. I was I never felt so tired, and I was like, oh man, I, I still got to get ready for regionals, but I didn't want to be selfish. So um, literally, I remember I ran, I ran the third leg. Um, it was literally tied and. <laughs> And all I remember is like my coach is like, just hang on, don't worry, hang on, like just get it to Devontae, get it to our, get it to the anchor leg, um, and, and and we'll win this thing. So I just remember just trying to hang on to the uh, to the third leg guy and just keep it close. And um, and I got gave the baton to uh, Devontae and he just passed the, the other the anchor leg on the, which is the fourth leg, and uh, we ended up winning the team title. And <laughs> I remember I was on the floor just just dying, and I remember everyone was just going crazy. And I'm like trying to catch my breath. Um, and but literally just probably the adrenaline came. I got up quick and I just started, I got into the crowd and I just started like <laughs> putting my fist up, like, yeah, we won, like <laughs> and just going crazy. So um uh, that was a pretty fun time. Everybody rushed out onto the onto the track, all the um all the, the coaches and the athletes and some of the fans. So um that was a pretty cool experience for me at, at uh, USC. I never uh, experienced anything like that. Yeah, that, that sounds absolutely incredible. Um, and despite all that glory, I think my the question that, that comes up the most from that is, will you uh, or have you ran a 400 meter since that day? <laughs> yeah, I've, that, read, I've, yeah, I've read a four by 400 relay, but I haven't read the open 400 meter, um, you know, probably, yeah, since since college, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so it's been like six years now, <laughs> I've been, yeah, six, six years, six years removed from college. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the relays and the dual meets are a lot different at the high school and collegiate level. Um, but, but moving into pro, um, Aaron, you alluded to it that you, you left USC and you pretty much went right into, to training with the Nike group. Is that right? Yeah. And, um, 
And what did that look like? Did you have other options that were on the table? How did you end up with Nike? Um, could you tell us a little bit about what that transition was like from, from collegiate to, to pro? Yeah, so um, Nike was pretty much the option that I almost knew what I was going for from my junior year because they were talking to me after my junior season um, and showing interest and, you know, they were wanting to send me some some gear and stuff. So I was doing that uh, through Glenroy, you know, so I didn't get in trouble. Um, so they sent it to him and he sent it to me. Um, so no NCAA violations or anything like that. But um, yeah, so, as soon as I turned pro, um, picked my agent and then he basically, uh, you know, told me my options and, you know, Nike was the main one that was sticking out. So I went with them and the, uh, what they wanted was for me to train with other Nike athletes. So um, there was a Nike coach in LA, but I felt like I liked the group better down in Florida. Um, there's three other guys that were in my age group that were also um, going down to Florida. So it seemed like that was the best place to go and um, made the move down there, trained with, you know, my coach I'm still with today. Um, so I've been there for, you know, what, seven years now, um, seven, eight years, whatever it is. And uh, just been, you know, grinding and trying to get better each year, um, trying to, you know, show what I can do as a professional um, out on the circuit and at world championships and the Olympics and all that, just trying to learn each year how to be a better professional and approach the game, um, you know, as a professional and, and show what I can do on this level because it's a lot different than it was in college. And um, I feel like every level that I've been at, it's kind of been that learning curve for me. Um, you know, initially in high school, I wasn't amongst the best. So I had to figure out what I had to do to get better and, you know, ended up being also champion and stuff like that. Uh, same thing in college. When I first came, I got destroyed my first year and I kind of said, okay, I, what I have to do to get better, um, you know, and ended up finishing runner up my senior year uh, in the 200 and being eight time all American um, when I was at USC. And then now the pro level is the same type of deal where my first couple of years were rough and, you know, came up short in some meets, but each year I've been getting better and working on things with my coach and, and um, climbing to get to where I am today. And, you know, just kind of see how far I can go with it and how, how high I can climb. Yep. Fantastic. Um, do you know yet if you're going to get a chance to wear those, those new Nike spikes that, that might be available for the, uh, for the summertime here? I should be able to. Um, okay. Yeah. They're, they're working on getting us though. So right now I'm just running in the super fly elite twos, but um, if I, if I get a chance to wear the max flies, I'll, I'll probably try those out, see how cool. they work for me. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Andre, you went, uh, you went to Puma and after a short stop at USC. So as you mentioned, you were this, just there for uh, a year and then you made the jump. Um, was it straight to Puma? Um, what made you go there? I mean, obviously there's a fairly well-known sprinter who I think some of us have, have heard of from, from Jamaica who, who represented Puma when you joined. But, um, other than that, what was, uh, what was it that, that drew you that way? And, um, and obviously you're still there, so things are going well, I assume. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't actually start off like that. Um, I remember I saw in, in college I was wearing um, I was wearing Nikes. Um, and um, yeah, I, I thought I was really gonna be signed with Nike. Um, I talked to the I talked to the um, the marketing guy. Um, and I remember he was uh, you know, he was very interested in me at the time. Um, he was like wanted me to come out and uh, he was just wanted to see he, like I didn't want to I didn't know I guess when to sign yet because I was like I just finished NCAAs and usually a lot of people usually sign right after NCAAs but I was just I really just didn't know at the time I didn't know a lot about track and I didn't really know a lot about being a professional I remember I think Aaron and was the only probably the only guy I really knew that went professional at the time because I was so new to it um, so I remember just asking him um, questions, how did, like, how was it all, how did it all happen, and, like, th and such like that, so I really just stalled, and I waited it out, um, I ended up doing the Pan American Games, um, and then after the Pan American Games, um, I had a talk again with Nike, thinking about, you know, coming out, and, um, but then I didn't, I just, again, I was just, like, stalling, I don't know, I don't know what I was waiting for, I kind of was just, like, in the moment, 
<laughs> just trying to figure things out, talk to more people because I was so new to it. And like my, my parents didn't know anything about it either. So I remember just talking to my mom and, you know, asking my mom, like, yeah, what do you think? And my, and my mom, and my, the first thought of my mom was like, well, just make sure you finish your degree. Like, cause she didn't really know much about track either. She was like, make sure you finish your degree, whatever if you go pro, like, make sure you just finish your degree because we didn't, I didn't know nothing about it, like how much money you can make or things like that nature. So, so again, I stalled it out, uh, went to the world championship, just kept my focus. Um, now I ended up getting a bronze medal at the, at the world championship in Beijing. And now like, it's like the whole world just, <laughs> just started talking to me. Like, I was like, I don't know. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. But everyone was just telling me like, you got to go pro. You got to go pro. Like, my phone was ringing and I was like, how did you get my number? Um, so it was pretty, it was pretty crazy. Like I was like, okay, I guess I must have to go pro. Right. But, um, but then I ended up talking to my coach um, and, um, you know, just trying to figure it out, you know, to see, see her opinion, to see if she could still coach me um, after, if I go pro, like is like college people still allowed to go, like still be with their college coach because I remember talking to Aaron and Aaron said like, no, he had to go to a Nike group in Florida um so yeah that was kind of like a like an adjustment trying to figure that out but then um yeah like um at the 11th hour um you know Puma Puma calls um so I was like oh wow okay so now it's another company that it's interested in me um so now I'm now I'm still thinking like I'm still it's we're in September and I'm still in school I'm still going to class still trying to figure this thing out um and then literally like two months later, I think in November, I was like, I was like, something just clicked. And I'm like, I gotta, I guess I gotta go pro. Like, like, why am I going back to college? Like, I already did all this. I already won NCAAs. Um, I did everything that I, that I could do in college. There's nothing else for me to accomplish. Um, so that I remember, I remember taking a visit to Nike headquarters in Portland, um, you know, thinking of, thinking about signing with them. And then I ended up taking a visit to, um, to Puma and really literally it was between those two companies adidas was in it for a little bit but it was mostly nike and puma and then i ended up just yeah in in uh the january of 26 16 i ended up you know took me like two months to figure it out i already took visit out i already everything was already done but i just had to come to a decision like am i going to be nike or puma and I, I felt like i wanted to change the game nobody in canada knew about puma like nobody wore puma so I felt like I wanted to change the game and I ended up signing with, signing with Puma. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks for sharing. I, uh, I actually didn't know that it, it, that you competed independently for that long. Um, before yeah. you, you made it that was, decision. It was about six, yeah, six months. <laughs> uh, okay. So we have about seven or eight minutes left. looks like seven now. And we do have some questions in the chat I'd like to get to. And uh, maybe if we have a quick minute, some, some rapid fire stuff too. So I'm just having a look at some of the questions in here uh, and I'm trying to find what would be um, really useful to, to a lot of people. Um, and this one could be for both of you. Um, someone's wondering if you had the chance to meet with, uh, with Usain Bolt before Rio 2016. <laughs> Uh, I met with him when we were going to get our medals in 2013 for the first time. Uh, when we medaled in the 4 by one you know, they obviously won. So before you get your medal, we take you backstage and um, you're kind of like in this waiting area before you go out. And then we had a press conference too, where you got to, you know, talk to the media after you win your medal and all that stuff. And, you know, he's sitting beside me and he was actually making jokes about like, um, Team Canada, because one of the questions was, what what our X meant when you throw this up? And he was making jokes about it, saying, um, you guys always throw that up or something like that. Like, what does that even mean? And um, I don't even know what we said. But yeah, I, I met him there <laughs> in uh, 2015 and when we medaled again in the relay in 2016 um, as well. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I met him actually um, – like I actually had a conversation with him um, in 2015 after the world championship in Beijing. He was doing a commercial at uh, at, at at USC and at our track. So I you know I met him there and actually got to talk to him for about yeah 30 minutes. So that was pretty cool. 
Um, so I just kind of just picked his brain a little bit and uh, just asked him, like, you know, how do, how do you do it? Like, you know, how are you so fast? Like, just, just questions like that, like, because I was just so new to the sport and, like, just asking him about training and, and things of that nature and, and uh, like, how is it like being, I guess, just how is it like being the fastest man in the world? Just stuff like, just, just like, just questions like just being a fan kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so it was pretty cool. Speaking of fans, there's a lot of fans of you two here. So I'd love to shift the conversation back over that way. Um, if we have time after this, we'll jump to maybe one more question from um, from the kids there. But I have a rapid fire round here that I, I'd love to, to get to. So um, we can do each one. Um, we'll go alphabetical by first name. Aaron's got the double A, so he'll be up, up first for each of these questions. And then Andre, if you can answer right <laughs> after. Um, so we'll go Aaron, Andre for for some of these questions. Um, what's the hardest workout you've ever done? Ooh, uh, probably a 400 meter breakdown, like all out. No, no, 250 times three all out. Yeah, I did that in, in college and I had like 10 minutes between each one, but dude, that was crazy. Cause I was, I had to run like my fastest 200 and then keep going for the 50 and then come back and do it two more times. And I was, I was dead after that. Andre, <laughs> um, uh, uh, I would say it's, uh, somewhere in the somewhere in the two fifty uh, range. I think where we'd have to like do breakdowns, uh, where we do like a two fifty and then get sixty second rest and then run a hundred meters and do do that three times. So I would say some something like that would, would probably be my hardest workout. All right, back back to Aaron. What's uh, your go to pre race meal? uh salmon with broccoli and potatoes um i would say uh yeah sweet potato uh broccoli and uh shrimp all right um do you listen to music before you compete or before you train and if so what's uh what's the go-to kind of pump up artist to help you get in the zone right now i do but i don't like listening to hype music um you know, I, I used to, but I, I would get too, too amped up. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to, I'm already amped with my nerves and my, my anxiety. So I like listening to mellow music. Um, I actually like listening to, to some Drizzy, of course. Um, J. Cole, you know, The Weeknd, um, stuff like that. A little Michael Jackson every now and then. You know, some stuff that people don't generally listen to, but I don't like to get too hyped now. I, I kind of change it up. Um, uh, yeah, I just listen to whoever's, uh, in that, in that, uh, who's ever new, uh, like I like to listen to hip hop and R&B. So, um, like, 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 uh, Aaron said, like Drake, J. Cole, um, Lil Babies. Um, yeah, I would say like whoever's just making good music at the time. <laughs> All right. Next question. Um, I have this picture here. It was given to me a while back. Um, this is the, the four by one team that's signed here by Bruni and Bailey. Um, you guys think that you can, you can get that. Um, <laughs> do you guys think that you're going to be able to, I, I see that this is, this is what my question is going to be. I'm going to rephrase it. Bailey and, and, and Surin are probably two of the most, um, famous Canadian sprinters all time, but we're looking now at the, the next generation and, and you two. Um, do you think that you're going to be able to um to to take away their their records in both the one and uh maybe even yeah we'll just focus on the hundred yeah <laughs> well in Rio we got their four by one record we just didn't get the gold like they did so that's uh the next thing that we got to do as a squad is get that that relay gold you know we've been bronze a few times but we got to upgrade that and get you know up there on the top of the podium but in terms of the hundred you know we're definitely hungry and chasing it and the more that Dre and I go back and forth pushing each other. Um, you know, it's, it's better for us and the faster we're going to run because we both want the best for, for Canadian sprinting. Yeah, that's why I changed the question there because I was about to ask if you could break the record when I remembered that you already did. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, we've got just a minute here and I, I don't want to keep you. So I'm going to grab one more um, one more audience question. And I think it's a really good one. Um, 
I wish we could spend more time on sort of the successes that you guys have had on the international stage, especially in the Olympic year and in your career. So um, real quick, what's the career highlight for you? And then um, there's a couple of athletes who are wondering kind of how you deal with stress and, and not performing quite as well as you could. So if we could wrap things up with just one more answer on kind of those two things, go from, you know, what's that highlight moment of your career? And then um, if you had advice for someone who gets stressed for racing or isn't performing quite as well, what would that advice be for a young athlete? Um, and Andre, we can go to you first on this one. We'll, we'll give Aaron a break from, from going first. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I think a lot of people would be surprised um, with this answer, but um, I feel like my, my favorite, like, it's, it's so weird. Like my favorite highlight of my, of my, is like when I won uh, the Pan American Games at home in Toronto, like that was just like an incredible feeling, like just to win at home in Toronto and uh, in front of my, my, my family and my friends. So like, that was like, like that was a super highlight for me, but of course, like the other best highlight as well is also the Olympic games. So it's kind of like, you know, Olympic games is more prestigious, but I just enjoyed that moment at home in Toronto as well. So it's kind of like a mix of both of those, like that I can't like, put on top of each other like they're kind of like you know just the same for me um but yeah and then um as for stress I mean um usually how I deal with it um you know everyone has nerves everyone gets nervous um um I try to just look at it as like I, I know it's hard to it's hard to say this but like it's you kind of got to just look kind of have to just look at it as practice you know just uh just think of it as practice you know if you're if you're prepared and practice is going well there, there should be nothing to be really worried about um you you know usually when you get out there you know the crowd you, you kind of just have to you can't get nervous from the crowd you kind of just have to use that energy to just you know just hype you up and, and, and get you going like you know they're here to see a show um and they want to see you run well uh, no one's, you know, trying to see you run bad, you know, that's what they came out to see you. So just think of it as just, you know, you're going out there having fun. Um, usually what I try to do um, just to like calm my nerves a little bit is usually like I will make sure I pee and <laughs> urinate before the race. And, um, um, you know, if I got to do a number two, sometimes, you know, you might have to, you might have to get that out the way. Um, but, but when I get on the line, I just literally just take a deep breath um calm my nerves I usually calm my nerves by just taking a deep breath um you know and just just go out there and uh just listen to the gun and execute so I feel like um that's you know that's the best way to do it also make sure you just you know drink lots of water um that usually you know calms your nerves as well awesome thanks for sharing that um I know we're just uh two minutes over time right now so uh if you got a scoot I totally understand but Aaron if, if you don't mind sticking around for just long enough to, to answer that same question. That would be awesome as well. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to take a page from what he said in terms of the first one of the career highlight is probably not what people think, but it's back in high school um, in 2010 when I won the bronze medal in Moncton um, in front of the home crowd. Like I still remember how I felt, um, you know, because I, I wasn't even supposed to run the 200 and, and I, I tore my hamstring at OFSA, um, rehab quickly to get back, you know, ran the hundred and I finished fifth, you know, and back then I didn't know um, that, you know, I was racing against people older than me. Um, it was under 19 and I was, I was still 18. So there's people a year ahead and I didn't realize how big of a advantage that was for them. Cause some of them were freshmen in college and going through all that program and stuff. So I was, I was still disappointed in myself um, cause I won silver at the world youth the year before. And I thought I was going to medal again, but then they told me I could run a two. So I'm like, all right. And each round I, I PR'd and ended up running 21 flat. And, you know, I had no idea how I did that. Um, I, I did that from lane nine and I was in front of the home crowd. And, you know, I was the first medal that the team got. And I don't know, it was just a really proud moment doing that, that victory lap, you know, in front of the home fans and, you know, they're bigging me up and stuff like that. So I, I, lo I love that moment. Um, another one was the four by one um, at Pan Am's when we had the, the gold for about an hour before we got DQ. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I just, just seeing a lot of people in the crowd when we were doing our victory lap, um, people that I grew up with and all the support we were getting, you know, those moments when you're in front of the home crowd, it just hits different, you know, like there's a lot of success that I've had 
um, overseas and in the NCAA and whatever it may be. But um, when you're having success in front of your home fans and the people that you grew up with and supported you um, and love you just because you're Canadian, you know, it, it just feels different. Like you get that sense of pride. Um, so for that's my answer for that. But um, in terms of common nerves, uh, there's a line that LeVar Ball said um, where he said, do you feel like they asked him if he feels like they're putting too much pressure on these kids, you know, by, by hyping them up and talking crazy like he does. And he said, why, why would they fear pressure? Um, it's just entertainment. So whenever I feel myself getting nerve, nervous and, and anxious, I always say it's just entertainment. You know, people are just here you to see, to see what you're supposed to do um, as an athlete. And if you were thinking about like the circus, um, no one goes to the circus thinking that the animals are going to have trouble doing their tricks or the, the people having trouble doing their flips, you know, the acrobats and all that stuff. You're not there to see them, you know, get nervous and, and shy and mess up and stuff. They, they're supposed to have it down. So um, as me being an entertainer, I'm supposed to go out there and perform and do what I'm paid to do. So I just always tell myself, it's just entertainment. Just go out there and know, do what you're supposed to um, you're supposed to do and what you're, you've been training to do. And don't overthink it. Don't think you have to do something new. Um, you already know you're capable of doing exactly what they're here to see. So just go out there and do it. Great advice. And so similar to what, to what Andre said, right? Um, in terms of just, you know, be calm, do your thing, get prepared. And uh, everyone's got their own probably routine that they go through beforehand. Okay. Um, we're a few minutes over time. Thanks to both Andre DeGrasse and Aaron Brown for joining us today for episode three. I'm sure there's a ton more we could have spoken about today. Um, I know there's a lot of questions here that we didn't have a time to get to. So I appreciate everyone who threw their, uh, uh, threw their comments. And if you have questions about recruiting and things like that, please reach out to us at Streamline Athletes. We're happy to help. And to Andre and Aaron, thanks again for joining us today, gentlemen. Um, our company at Streamline Athletes, all the, the, athletes who have joined here today and i'm sure um everyone watching at home here in canada is rooting for you guys going into this summer so we're really looking forward to watching you continue to develop and um hope to see some big things coming so thanks so much and uh and take care and good luck i appreciate it all right thanks brett appreciate it good talking to you guys okay we'll talk to you soon take care